Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, uh, I should have took up opera. No, I shouldn't have. Uh, so anyway, welcome to the sh- another podcast of The Chris Voss Show. Uh, we've got a wonderful guest here today. Be sure to give us a like, subscribe to us on YouTube, hit that bell notification. You know the drill, so you get all those mobile notifications from you. Thanks to at and and the new Samsung Galaxy S8 and S8 Plus, which we are simulcasting uh, right now on Periscope and uh, Facebook Live. So thanks to them for their uh, continued love and support. Uh, and also, uh, be sure to go to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Chris Voss. I'm joined today by the wonderful and beautiful, smart, intelligent uh, Dr. Cynthia Colon, who is the author of Tips, Tales, Truths for Teens. And uh, we're going to talk some more about uh, what uh, is in her mind and what she thinks about everything. Welcome to the show, uh, Mrs. Colon, Dr. Colon, I should probably say. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here and I'm super excited. Yeah. Yeah. So you wrote this great book for teens, your doctorate of education. So you might be the smartest person I've ever had on this show, which certainly isn't me. Um, the, uh, I have a doctorate in alcoholism, I think. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, uh, I definitely have one in vodka, I'm pretty sure, but uh, you've got something that's probably worth a whole lot more. So tell us about the book. Tell us about yourself, and let's get to know you. Uh, I um, So Cynthia Colon and I grew up in Bellflower, California, and I was the first in my family to go to college. And I actually, when I was applying to college in uh, as my senior year, I had no idea what to do, where to find an application, Uh, I kind of knew the counselors, but, you know, my parents didn't go. Not a lot of members of my family went. So we had to sort of find, um, figure out uh, how to get some information. So my mom was on a mission. My mom was always sort of my superhero. And she called her brother, and we found uh, Mr. Vargas at USC. And we drove up the 110 freeway in the brown Oldsmobile and went there. And uh, he was kind enough. And I think about it now, and it was like, must have been six o'clock at night because it certainly wasn't during the day. My mom worked. So it was, you know, after hours and he spent some time giving me some words of encouragement and, and really teaching my mom how she was going to be able to pay for this with through financial aid. So basically his, his mission in life was to help students as many students as he could to get them to apply specifically to USC, but in college to college in general. And so this book is really, I think my gift back, to the world and um, being their mentor and cheerleader and giving the roadmap that empowers any student who has a dream of going to college, um, giving them the roadmap and the tools they need to succeed and uh, navigate this process. So there you That's go. awesome. And I know it's a, it's a tough process. You got those tests that you have to take. You've got, yeah, what is it? The SATs, I believe it is. Oh, and then, you know, and nowadays you got to be careful what you post on social media. There's a bunch of people from this latest batch of college uh, applications that got denied because of uh, hate stuff they found on social media. I think it was Yale or somebody really. I think it was Yale or Harvard, or possibly both. But you're you're so right. Actually, one of my first interviews, they talked. They asked me about that, and I said, you know, you've got to be careful. And students can't hear it. Teens can't hear it enough because they hear it from their parents. But they can't hear it enough that, you know, what you put out there lives out there and you are your own brand. And when you become attached to a college and say, yes, you know, I'm choosing this college, they, you're an extension of their brand as well. So it all sort of circles back and you, and you want to make sure you, you know what's out there about you. So the book's a great roadmap of, of how, to, how to go through all the different hoops you have to jump through and everything else and get into college and get, get into a good college because that's important learning and uh uh you know it's it's so important people get a good education nowadays education uh i was mentioning before we went live that my mother was a teacher so was my sister uh so i've been exposed to you know their complaints all my life of the <laughs> education system getting enough funding from legislatures uh, at the time, they, they did their uh, schooling in Utah, and in Utah, uh, at the time, a lot of legislatures were cattle ranchers who didn't understand college, you know, and uh, what's that about? Uh, 
and uh, so they didn't they didn't fund education very well and I think it's led to some of the real leadership challenges we have in this country and and a voting public that that isn't well educated in being able to discern what to do in life and I think that's why we're having a lot of the problems I, I, to me our leadership is reflective of our society and so there's that well I would love you one of my one of my goals, goals is to really figure out how to change the culture. How do we grow a nation that it has a college going culture? Because it's not that way now. And you're mentioning Utah, and I was re looking up some stats this morning. Uh, the student to counselor ratio across the country is 477 to one, but the recommended is 250 to one. And only uh, uh, three states, I want to say Wyoming, New Hampshire, Vermont, um, are just below that. Um, and then you can imagine the states that are above 700, California, Michigan, Minnesota. Um, and I was surprised to see that Utah was, I think it's above 600. And I, and, and I thought, wow, that should be a state that has lower, but it's not. So you're right you know we're just not funding there's just not enough money to go around it's not that the counselors don't care or the teachers don't care your mom your sister you know they don't you know teachers go into this profession because they love students they want to help they want to give back but um there's only so many hours in the day and um, i think that my book just helps to supplement what students get in the in, at school and at home at home it's not meant to replace you know what they're getting already yeah, it's a, it's definitely a thing. I mean, my, I watch my mom go through. They were literally doubling the size of her classes, and she's like, "I can't." You know, it's like it went to like 40, 45 people, and in Utah, I mean, they just they were just constantly cutting the education budget back, and they didn't. You know, the because Utah is kind of like one city was kind of central, and everything else was very rural. Yeah. You had these legislatures that represented the. Let the rural areas and they they didn't you know they just I, I suppose they looked at they looked at uh, education and college the same way that you know they always they always say those liberal elites of the coastal liberal elites you know yeah um, which uh, I don't know how do you feel about college being uh, education college being free for everyone there's still talk about that from the Bernie Sanders area camp and and uh, I don't know you know there's it's we've got to do something about the cost because it keeps going up right i mean it's how much what, what's that bubble going to be when is it going to burst because uh, we're really at anywhere from 30 to sixty thousand dollars a year uh to go to college right i mean i guess you know community college is much more affordable we've got the state schools if you're from within that state but once you add on the the room the board the, the um all the books that you need so we've got to do something now i say that and i think you know not every not government can't sustain everything so i know that the schools that have been successful have done outside um fundraising really pushing in the fundraising uh usc is one of my is my alma mater but so i know that they've done just an incredible amount to supplement or to to fundraise so they have that money in the budget for scholarship tuition dollars for people who can't afford that so I don't know what the answer is um, you know um, European schools have a different uh, situation where you you know you, you're sort of tracked pretty early on as to what you're going to do um, so I don't know that that's the answer because I think that there's so many promising students that just don't know what they want to be or haven't figured out haven't found that mentor to cheer them on um, and so I don't know that tracking them early is the answer. Um, but in terms of cost, we've got to find a way to reduce it. Um, I, I was going to say, I, you know, I don't believe in a complete free ride because you want to, I want, I feel like people have skin in the game, right? You, you're, you're more apt to sort of really uh, give it your all when you also have um, something in it. Um, so somewhere in between, but 60,000 is just not doable for most Americans. You know, you bring up a good point. I owned a mortgage company for almost 20 years before the meltdown of the mortgage business. And 
Uh, I never went to college. I was one of those people that uh, they say doesn't need to go to college. And I, I guess I'm unique. I used to think I was like everyone. and But some people tell me I'm a little unique. I don't know that I am. Uh, but <clears throat> for whatever that's worth. But I started my first business at 18. And I just and I was actually signed up to go to college with a Pell Grant. My parents are very poor. And so we had a Pell Grant to go to the University of Utah. And I signed up for the classes with a Pell Grant. And I was supposed to go in the summer. And in the short term, I had gotten fired from McDonald's for long hair. I had long, you know, hair as a rocker. And the uh, one of the managers just really hated, he was very religious, and he hated that I was that rocker, you know, demon, yeah. whatever, you know. You listen to that bad music. Bad. Um, and bad. so, <laughs> yeah, and I would cut my hair, so he fired me one day. And three months later, I went back and thanked him because I started, uh, I'd, I'd taken up my dad's uh, subcontracting business that I'd learned as a kid and working with him and started my first business. Yeah. And within three months, I was making more than this guy was. And once I got the entrepreneur bug, it never quit. And uh, it's been a blessing all my life and a curse sometimes, I would say. But uh, I have seen over the years the need for the people do need to get a formal education. Now, I educated myself on, on my own. I subscribed to Harvard Business Review. I would take the courses. I would read every business book you ever could get a hold of, every business magazine. I prepared myself and spent a lot of time training to be a CEO of a company when I became one. And we built a lot of great companies over the years. But the getting back to what I segued from, I apologize. Um, in the mortgage business, we would get people's, uh, when you get a mortgage loan application, it's a P&L of someone's life, a profit and loss of someone's life, a balance sheet. And you can also, of course, you see their credit. So you can see where they've been for the last 10 years at least. And uh, so you get an idea as to what's going on with their life. You see what their payments are, what their income is, what's going out. And one of the things that I would see a lot of is uh, even even on, up to the level of being a, a doctor, like a prescription doctor or a surgeon, um, the amount of money you would have to pay every month to service your loans, your college loans. Yes. And I would it would it was shocking to me. I'd see people that were doctors that were making an incredible amount of money, but half their income was going to the, the loans and they would be, you know, on the hook for them for 10 years. And they would be basically living like people who weren't a doctor at that level of income when it came down to it with what was left over. And then I would meet people that, you know, well, I went to college and I did social studies to become a social worker and I paid, you know, I don't know, 120,000 or hundred that, you know, and, and I'd be like, did, did anyone ever sit down with you and go, it's great that you want to go into that job, but do you understand that the income that you're going to make is not going to be sustainable to the college loans? You know, it, it seems like a lot of these kids never do the math of what they're, they want to do is going to pay out. Um, and I don't know if you talk about that in your book, but it's definitely something that people need to be aware of. <laughs> well, Tips, Tales, and Truths is going to eventually be a series, so, sort of like the chicken soup um, but the education series, and so there'll be lots of iterations that come out, and, and finances is one of them because you're right. Um, it, it you know doesn't balance out, right? What you know, I mean, it, it took me almost until I was 40. By the time I mean, I have I went all the way in school. I went you know I got my doctorate. So at every stop, I had more loans that piled on, and yeah. so I was near you know uh, 40, and and I was able to to buy my condo in West Hollywood and all that happened but uh, you know yeah you're living and you're like eating beans and rice you know for a long time um, before that income matches sort of what your degree level is yeah. and you're right um, and I think that's what parents get nervous about right oh my, my son daughter wants to major in this and they know as an adult that's not gonna you know I think about teachers and uh, when I was a principal I really tried to figure out how can I make this work? How can I develop a summer program that each of my teachers were almost independent contractors, like didn't work for the school, but actually paid rent to the school. And then they could have keep 80% of the income and I could just keep the 20% to like keep the lights on and water the grass. Um, just so I can help, help. I mean, just feel, I felt like that was a social just thing to do to supplement their income in the summer to find a way. Um, so 
again, with um, Pell Grant, I was a Pell Grant uh, student as well, uh, but the loans that we have to take uh, to, to, to go to the school we want to, right? And so I, I, what I want to do is more talk about that there are a lot of colleges out there that give merit scholarship. I mean, if you have a 3.5 GPA, just a regular B student, moderately involved, there are plenty of colleges. So we always think of like just the top 100 schools that we can all rattle off right now across the country. We can name them, the Ivy League schools, the major, you know, Pac-12, the SEC. But there are so many schools in between. Uh, I can think of Xavier and Gonzaga and St. Louis University and uh, Wesleyan uh, in, uh, thinking of in Ohio, I think. So lots of little schools that will give merit aid to our B students, they'll be happy to have them. So if you can get away with paying very little, if any at all, um, for, for your bachelor's degree, you're gonna save yourself a ton of money because again, if you get the bug and you keep going in school, graduate school, you're gonna have to take loans. Um, so whatever people can do, and that's a family choice, it's a family decision, I understand, but I am a big proponent of trying to um, get your first degree paid for in some way. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting, and I've got and the funny thing is I've got friends. I don't have any children myself. I've got friends that have kids now because we're all in our about our fifties. Not you, me, um, and uh, you clearly <laughs> much. Yeah. Um, I don't. I'm not there yet. I'm just the side of uh, the you know darker side of forties. <laughs> don't don't come here to fifty. I'm just telling you right now. Uh, uh, it's not too bad. You'll probably do better than I did. I, I lived, a, I, I, had, I had too much of a good time in life. Um, so I'm a little worse for the wear, but I have friends that are 50 and they're now of course putting their kids through college. And, uh, I'm of course glad I didn't have kids. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> because, because uh, they're, you know, some of my friends are paying for their kids college or at least assisting and the astronomical costs of it are just incredible. And the hidden uh, costs. All the hidden costs, right? Once you're there, if you're gonna go Greek life, if you're gonna, I mean, if you're a business major, you need to subscribe to, you know, to all the, um, I'm thinking Wall Street Journal, you need to subscribe to everything and get into those societies and do this and do that and, and uh, travel abroad in the summer if you want to. I mean, so there's all these other hidden costs as well. So how you go about saving for that or planning for that, I mean, you, you probably know better than me how to, how to do that. What are, do you give advice to your, to your? You might family? know better how to plan for college and, and stuff like that than I do. I I just I, since I never even went through the process, I have no idea uh, how to do it or, or what to do. I've been very blessed in life where I've always been able to turn some sort of thing into a dime, um, and uh, I don't know, it's it's whatever. But uh, I, I it certainly has. Choosing the life of being an entrepreneur is definitely different, as I'm sure you know now. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned you used to be a principal of a school. Oh. I think you said. Yeah, that. I was a principal of a school. So I, um, yeah. I worked at Vassar College in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York, in the admission office, and then um, that was after I was doing some. My graduate work was at a teachers' college at Columbia. So I ended up staying in New York for five years, and then headed back uh, to Marymount High School, where I was the director of college counseling, and then stayed there until I did my doctorate uh, in a number of, of roles, and then I moved into being a principal at St. Bernard High School, which is a private Catholic school in Playa del Rey. Uh, that was a turnaround school. That was a, a place where there was no Wi-Fi. This is um, 2012. There was no Wi-Fi. <clears throat> the heat wasn't working in some of the class, most of the classrooms. The computers that they had for our teachers God bless them. Um, you know, we're like had little hamsters, you know, doing the, you know, charging it up and, and getting it warm. It took like 20 minutes to get warmed up in the morning. <laughs> Attendance. I mean, it was just, you know, crazy. So uh, I went in and, um, you know, my heart is with what, you know, what do the students need? What can we do? What can we give them? And this had been a school that was sort of the pride and joy of the uh, LA uh, Archdiocese schools years ago. Um, General Kevin Chilton, four-star general, is an alum, and he's, he's a great man. I, I met him, and he was on Space Shuttle in Denver. So lots of great people who graduated from here. Anyway, in the three short years I was there, we were able to 
do uh, over $2 million worth of renovation. They have Wi-Fi, thank goodness, you know, all of this. But um, so it all happened. But in my first year, um, I'm kind of going on a tangent, but I, I, have to, I think you'll like the story. My first year, the college football, I mean, the, the football coach quit um, just before school. And so I had 35 to 40 boys, seniors, transfer out like weeks before school started. This is actually a tale in the book. It's one of my favorite tales. And um, basically, I was down to, I don't know, something like 50 kids in the senior class. We barely had enough. Uh, uh, there was eight kids going to football practice. So time was getting short, and I had to cancel varsity football for the first time in school history. You can imagine <laughs> that I was just, you know, beloved, of course, you know. Now, yeah, you probably got a few parent calls, huh? <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was like, it was the worst thing. But I had no choice because I had eight kids showing up to practice. So those kids ran and transferred to another school in hopes of, I don't know, you know, getting caught. I don't know what they, you know, what they sold them on the other on, on the other end. But I pled with the, the league principals. I said, um, there was this young man named, named his real name is Jason. I, oh, I can't remember what I called him in the book, but he was a senior and he was a legacy student. He was determined to stay on that varsity team. And so he stuck with it. He didn't transfer out and he went around recruiting freshmen and sophomores and other peers. And by the first day of school, we had 30 kids to show up to the football meeting. So we would have had enough for varsity team, but I had already like registered it with CIF, you know, California Interscholastic Federation that we were going to be a JV team. Anyway, I pled with the principals to let these six seniors have some playing time. Um, even if it was, you know, only two at a time because our league rules said seniors are not allowed to play JV. Uh, anyway, it took all of five minutes. They said, no, they said they just weren't having it. I think my football coach from before who had quit was not, not in good standing with, you know, they would, he would run up the score. They had gone 10 and 0 the year before. I mean, it was just a disaster. Uh -huh. So I had to go and take, convey this news to these six boys and I had them in a room with the, with the coach. And I said, you know, Jason and, and everybody else, I'm really sorry, but you're not going to be able to play, you know. And so it's your choice if you want to stay on the team. And Jason said, you know, coach, I'm in. You know, I'm in. I'm, I'm here, whatever you need. And he, you know, the rest of the boys. So they were literally water boys for freshmen and sophomores and juniors. Fetching <laughs> balls. I mean, so Jason, the story is, I think, the tip is called leadership doesn't always come in a title, Right. I was the student body president. I was the cheerleader. I was this and that. But the stories that stick with me um, that I've either read or that I've experienced, like Jason, are these stories that he was like through and through just a leader because he thought that was the right thing to do. And so he's, he's a good example that you don't have to be the editor in chief or the captain to really stand out and have a great story to tell. And he told that tale and he's off. He's in college. I think he's probably a junior or senior now. And um, so, you know, there's a, any kid at any high school can do something like that, right? Something that uh, doesn't go their way and they just turn it around and make, you know, lemonade out of lemons. That's a great line. Leadership. Uh, Leadership doesn't, doesn't always come in a title. Yeah, that's such a great line because there's so many great uh, opportunities for leadership. And a lot of people sit back and go, well, until I get the title, I'm not going to try harder or lead or do anything and it's like no actually that's how you get the title is people see you as a leader um it's when i work for other people early on as a kid uh that's how i advanced people saw me as a leader for some reason i don't know what they saw in me um, <laughs> but for some reason i guess i uh, they saw a leader and so they uh gave me manager positions um one thing that's interesting and you, you, and you'll uh, is over the years with my mom we'd have a lot of discussions about education and of course a lot of it came out of uh her talking about some of the trials and tribulations i mean sometimes she was spending like 250 bucks to sometimes a whole lot more than that a month to go out and buy supplies and i mean these these parents especially some that are very ugly teachers don't realize how much of these teachers and I'm sure principals and vice principals um, pay out and the extra hours and time and that they put in 
uh, you know, they, they help kids beyond, you know, they, they actually do target kids that are having trouble and they try and give them extra assistance. Of course, sometimes it's compounded like my mom with double class sizes um, where you don't have enough time to get to that child. But the, the, the money that she was spending was just insane. And uh, just her personal money. And I go, Mom, why doesn't the legislature, you know, give you more money? You're like, well, they actually cut our budget, Chris. And, you know, she was going out and buying stuff. And she did it for the love of what she did. She did it for the care about the things. And it really is sad in this country that we spend, you know, the amount of money we do on military hardware. And education is just out the window. And I think we're seeing the ramifications of that. But one thing that I always had a discussion with her, and you referenced it earlier, was the European model of trying to identify what kids' strengths are as to what their future might be and have a guiding sort of thing. Um, and I really believe that's what we need because we have this, we have this gunshot one size fits all approach and you have kids that have ADD problems. I had ADD problems as a child. My brother had a lot of them. You know, he was the kid who was on Ritalin. Um, and um, one of my problems was I'm not a book functioning sort of learning person. I'm a very visual person. I, I can remember faces better than I can remember names. Uh, if you show me how to do something or you engage me in doing it, I learn it very quickly like that. I can drive, if I drive to a place, I know how to get there again. I'm just, I'm, that's how I'm built. But if you sit me in the classroom and start lecturing to me, the mind goes Woo -hoo, out the window. Math classes, I, I just, I failed at so much stuff. It wasn't even funny. Uh, but I was really brilliant. I figured out early on in high school that I only needed 26 grad, uh, credits to graduate from high school. And I knew I was poor. I knew I was getting into Yale. Uh, but I knew that if I took all my classes, I would actually have like 50 credits. So my brain went directly from home base to second in a straight line. And that's pretty much how it works for me. And so I went, why do I need to take all these extra classes? So I just started failing classes and I actually went to my teacher and said, I'm going to fail it. They, they were like, why are you failing my class? And I go, because I don't need your credit to graduate from high school. I'm not going to Yale. I'm poor. Where it's going to be a Pell Grant. They, they don't care what my grades are. I don't think anyone's going to care what my grades are. And uh, so I'm just going to flunk. And so I flunked most everything. I barely passed uh, with the 26 uh, credits I needed. But the interesting thing about that is, is I went on to build several multi-million dollar companies. I think I've had about 26 different corporations that I've been the registered agent named on. Uh, I did all the accounting for our companies. So for a kid who flunked math, algebra, and sucked at all that sort of good stuff, I was able to learn the accounting, pick it up, do all the accounting for my companies. Um, I could do math in my head pretty well. And the more I get, the it's not, it's not doing as well. <laughs> But it used to be I could do math very quickly. In fact, I could wander around my office and kind of know what the sales figures were just by listening to tidbits here and know what was going on. And my my uh, partners were always just amazed. They're like, they're like, you just have this ability to count in your head. And uh, even to a point where I used to count things on the road and my psychologist would say that the, the reason you do that for business is the only thing that makes you not insane. Because if you did it just to do it, you would be insane. But you're counting everything. That's what you're doing. Um, but it was interesting. It really would have helped me in school uh, to have someone go, you know what? You're that guy. You're that entrepreneur guy. You're the guy who needs a different sort of application. <laughs> and I really feel bad for a lot of these kids because I think it's a disservice that they have this one a one size fits all. Well, it, you can on oh, so many points that I just make me crazy, right? Because, listen... <laughs> I had the privilege to work at a private elite girl school in Los Angeles and um, after coming from Vassar. And not everybody, but basically um, there are, uh, there's a story in there in the book, Tips, Tales, and Truths. I think it's like number two or something. And there was about three or four families that would bring their daughters in before freshman year or freshman beginning or end of freshman year to make a plan. And you know, they came in and said, you know, I mean, their goals were Ivy League t tended to be. Um, and I always say, so part of the book says, you know, shoot for the moon, um, but you, and you might land on the star. That's okay. 
So looking back when I was reflecting on the different tales that I was going to put in the book, I thought, oh my gosh, what those parents did for their children, their, their daughters, just before going into freshman year or in freshman year, is what everybody should get, right? What is it? Well, I would spend an hour, hour and a half mapping out, backwards mapping, and your mom would know that term, right? The teacher's backwards map uh, and say, okay, here's the goal. So let's talk about academics. And if you're going to uh, want to get into AP calculus, well, what do you need to take before that? That's pre-calculus. So, so you need, you know, geometry, you know, et cetera. What's the map for that? And the same thing with leadership. You know, if you're going to want to be the student body president, okay, you know, you can't hog all the leadership titles. So how do you, you know, do this, do that? So we would literally make a strategic plan for someone who is 13, 14 years old. And when I look back, I'm like, I knew, I, you know, I was that little leader and little, you know, I wanted to coordinate everybody and fix everything. And um, I, I dreamed of a couple of things. I wanted to be an, I said teacher. But I also knew that I wanted to be like the Katie Couric. I don't know who it was back then, but whoever it was, I would say, I want, I want to be that. And now I talk about, well, I want to be the Susie Armand or the Oprah of college counseling or college you know, education. So I knew then, right, sort of what I wanted to do. And I knew what I was good at and what I liked. And if we could do that with every single student, oh my gosh, look, think about where we would be. But when you talk about having 45 kids in the classroom, when we talk about, um, having almost 500 to 1 student to counselor ratio. There are only so many hours a day. The kids that are getting the attention, don't get me wrong, they need it, right? They're the kids who are going through depression or having you know, divorce at home. Maybe they didn't get fed last night. Um, you know, you know, they could be homeless. I mean, so worrying or a kid asking, you know, about an AP or an honors class seems trite. I mean, it just seems like that's just not a as big of a deal for me to deal with because I've got these kids who are dealing, you know, discipline issues or, you know, trying to flunk out of class or trying to, you know, whatever. So it's a, it's a travesty that we can't give, um, you know, every single kid what these young women were getting at this private elite school. And that's sort of like, I think about what can I do? And when I talk about supplementing what's there, I want, I hope counselors out there, I want, you know, I hope to be a consultant for, for counselors in school districts so that eventually my videos, although I'm embarrassed to watch the, my videos now, right? But as I redo them and refine them, that counselors and teachers can say, go here, find this video or, or, or make a map. There's a video on how to map out strategically for your next four years. Yep. So that's, you know, how do we uh, give the, the champagne education on a, on a beer budget, you know, you know, the, and, and it's great that you do that. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure how many parents really sit down and, and do what you were talking about where they map out where the child is going. Um, you know, the line that always comes to me from the movie fight club, uh, where, you know, what did your, what did your dad tell you to do? He said, go to school. So I went to school and then I got out of school. He said, what do I do now? You go to college. I went to college. What do you do now? You get married. And, and a lot of these parents, like even even I'll talk with some of my relatives or friends and be like, you know, you really should be teaching your child coding because there's a real future in coding and computers. And, you know, I mean, for me, when I went to high school and junior high, they taught us we had to take leatherworking, metal shop, and wood shop. And, and I even took welding classes because I didn't want to take any other classes and I could goof off a welding class. Um, and I did some things to make it so I had two welding classes because everything else filled up and I, I didn't get my stuff in on time. And this is because I was flunking on purpose. And I think the girls had to, we, I had to take home ec or, or, and yeah. typing or something like that. Sewing. Yeah. Sewing. I, in my school, there was a sewing class that the girls would take. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was just amazing, the, the stuff. You know, I... I, I wrote a blog post about this, the, and, and I don't want to discourage other people in saying this. I don't want to discourage other people saying that education is worthless. But for me, in the unique sort of brain, whatever I have, and, and an application to recreating the education system to be targeted to certain people and, and build on their strengths, because there are some people, like I, I just interviewed the other day, the Saddleback Leather CEO, uh, Dave Munson, 
who I saw that interview. It was incredible. I, I, of course, I want all the products now. <laughs> yeah, obviously, leather shop worked for him, and it still does in, in today's computer age. Uh, I don't know that he took leather shop, but <laughs> you get the idea. But but uh, for me, um, the number one thing that I learned in school, the the most profitable thing that I learned was typing class, being able to type. Yeah. And I, I'm horrible in English, still am, but I, I've, I've tried to learn as much as I can. Um, but learning to type, and when we first started our little businesses, being able to type out uh, the invoices yeah. and you know make it look <laughs> legitimate. And my business partner at the time, uh, and great friend at the time, um, we would we would take turns each weekend typing out the invoices to send to our clients. And he would be sitting there henpecking like this. And I had the ability to just go and put it out. And of course, being uh, a lot of the writing and, and chitter chat that I do online, typing has been one of the most important things I ever learned. But it's, it's, a, it's a darn shame that that's really the most important thing that I got out of all that learning. Now, some of that, some of the English, math, and other things that were put in my head, I think they kind of sat in there and kind of coagulated a little bit. And, uh, and stuff, but uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose if we built a targeted system where we had to do the European model, it would cost more because, right, we'd have to have more teachers that would be. Yeah, it would cost more. And, and something you said earlier uh, rang tr rings true for me. I'm also, uh, I'm an auditory learner and a visual learner. Um, and, uh, you know, just listening to things, I can sort of, you know, I, I get I get what I need. But I took a year off to write the book and um, when you talk about uh, and lots of people talk about sort of engaging you know uh, tell me and I forget show me and I you know I think learn and engage me and I remember I think is the is the quote by Benjamin Franklin and nothing was more true to me than driving uh, I drove all the way north all the way um, to Seattle and then across and I live I moved to Ohio to get away and write the book. But I, you know, I went to baseball, I went, went to 18 baseball stadiums in the last year. I've been to, I don't know how many states, been to national parks. And finally, I'm like, oh, all this stuff I've been learning. I, I, you know, experiential learning is, there's just nothing like it. And it would inspire me in, in a way, and I just started writing all the time. And um, some of the tales that were inspired in my real life most of them took place in Los Angeles, but I, I would take different pieces of different cities I've been to, like South Bend and Chicago, and I went to a Cubs game, and so there's one tale that sort of incorporates that. Cleveland is another tale that incorporates, you know, people from Cleveland, and I think I think about that all the time, and so one of the dreams I had that I never saw to fruition because I, I left being principal was how do we, like, twice a month rotate sort of big field trips, you know, so that there's no school on that day. But, um, you know, a portion, so a portion of the school uh, students would be home so they can catch up on homework or catch up on sleep, God forbid, you know, our teens need sleep. But um, a, a quarter to a half of them would go and ex experience life. So I think there's just nothing better. So there's a better system. We, we, we're far, I think we're far from the best system, um, what we have now in terms of training and really honing in on what students' true passions are because I, I believe they know them. I, I believe we know who we are. Uh, Rich Demiro, who I mentioned earlier, he's rich on tech, his, is his website. I asked him not too long ago, I said, when did you know you liked you know, messing with gadgets? He said, oh my gosh. When I was young, I was messing with gadgets when I was young. I'd take things apart. I'm like, did you like sports? He's like, no. Nah. I mean, and even now, he's a Trojan as well. He'll go, he'll tolerate a football game because he's a Trojan. But, you know, I'm like, I like sports more than he does. And he knew he liked gadgets. But, uh, oh, my gosh. I would love to go to, you know, top 10, 20 football stadium, college football stadiums, you know, and, and do a TV show on that because I just, I just love football. But Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting the dynamics, dynamics of our new society where – uh, now the nerds are in control as opposed to the jocks. Because when I was growing up, um, you were a loser if you weren't a jock, you know, and you were just kind of pushed to the side. And I, I don't know if I was technical back then, but uh, 
I, I, I didn't really get computers. I wasn't a coder sort of person. I don't know what I was, but I was lost in that, that, uh, that uh, area of not being a jock. And of course, those guys know where they're going and, and what's going on. Um, sorry, I had to shut off my Google Home here. Uh, so, um, well, let's round up the show. We'd love to have you on. I think we could do some more talking, Doc, about uh, all the right, different right. stuff and education. I'd like to talk in the future, too, about you know the, the feeding and care of these kids and and uh, that's a big thing. Diet, of course, is a huge thing. <clears throat> I used to watch my ADD friends that had problems in school. You know, my parents were poor, so we couldn't afford those expensive cereals. And I'd, I'd go to my friend's house, and they'd pour out those sugar cereals, and they'd put, like, a pile of sugar, and they'd go to school with that, and they'd literally, you know, be in space launching, uh, like, a rocket ship. And then I read about these kids in, in ghetto areas that aren't getting fed before they come to school, and they've had to develop school programs. Uh, one of the most shocking things I saw was kids being shamed in Alabama recently because <laughs> they're coming up to they were bringing the school lunches and you're just like, what is going on? So, anyway, thank you for joining us. We could, I probably should be fine, fine. fine. Sure. Uh, so, it's everything is Dr. Cynthia Colon, all one word. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and of course my website, drcynthiacolon.com. You can find you can find the book there. The book is available on Amazon. But also there is an, a ton of free resources. These videos that are on my web page as well. So there are uh, colleges that I spotlight. There are college essay writing videos um, and a, a few other things for parents and for students. So uh, there you go. Some great resources. And go get her book. You can probably find it on Amazon, Tips, Tales, and Truths for Teens. And uh, there you go. In fact, it's coming in the mail. I'm going to get a chance to read it uh, probably tomorrow, I think. And uh, we'll take a look at it and all that good stuff. So thank you for coming by. We'd love to have you again because we could probably have hours of discussions and uh, everything else. The only reason I'm wrapping is because we've got uh, another show here at 11 or at 1. But uh, otherwise, we'd probably go for another hour. But thank you for coming. I certainly appreciate it. And be sure to uh, go to Amazon, get her book, if you will, guys. Uh, be sure to give us a like, subscribe to us on YouTube, hit that bell notification button. I hate having to plug this stuff, but it's necessary to support the show, so we appreciate you guys' support. Uh, go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Voss. You can actually get an exclusive Facebook groups that we have to give away some of the cool gadgets that we have. Thanks to our good friends at AT&T with the fastest download and upload speeds for providing us with the Samsung Galaxy S. Eight and S8 Plus, which we love. We're looking forward to the note. You can pre-order that now uh, for helping us simulcast this to uh, Facebook Live and uh, Periscope. If you see me looking up this way, I'm always checking the Periscope feed to make sure everything's working there. So anyway, thanks for coming by, and we'll see you next time. Okay. Take care. Have a great day. You too.